You may remain seated. Grace, mercy, and peace are your blessings because you have a God who forgives iniquity and covers up guilt. The words we'd like to meditate on this morning are from Psalm 32. Arrange the order of the words in the psalm a little bit differently so that the inside parts match a little better for English hearers. Uh, Maskeel is um, it's a discovery of an insight that I wish to pass on by teaching. Of David a Maskeel, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. See, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt or death of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. See them. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright. My dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Savior, before us this morning is a psalm that is 3,000 years old, written originally in Hebrew by King David. The beauty of the Hebrew words do not, does not really come across as it ought to when we translate it into English. Try to sing this poem, and of course there is no melody that remains given to us by the Holy Spirit. No clue how it sounds. And we live on the other side of the world. This is a Middle Eastern uh, Semitic kind of thinking and poetry writing, and it doesn't fit very well in English at all. And so a person wonders, with all of that difficulty, how in the world are we supposed to get anything out of such an old, archaic, strange song that we can't sing? This is a mosquito. This is something that David wants to make sure, an insight, that he wants to make sure that he is passing on. David understood this was Bible writing from the whole world. And despite all of these obstacles, the message of the psalm is absolutely clear. Blessed is the person whose sins are forgiven and whose guilt is covered. Blessed is the person whom the Lord does not count his sins against him, and in whose heart there is no deceit. Before we go on to think about forgiveness in the psalm, it's probably a good idea for us to remember what the Bible has taught us about this thing called forgiveness. I have borrowed this verbatim from Professor Brooks' commentary on the book of Psalms. Forgiveness rests on the mercy and grace of God. That means it does not rest on whether I feel forgiven. It does not rest on what I have paid for forgiveness. It does not rest on what I promise God that I'm going to do in the future. It rests completely and absolutely on the grace and promises of God. Forgiveness is always based on a payment for sin. 
That's why when a person who wants to get even, wants to get revenge, says, I'm going to make you pay. That's what has to happen for sins. That's what has to happen for sins to be removed. The forgiveness of sins is based on a payment for sin. And you really have to pay the whole bill. The forgiveness of sins is a verdict. It's an announcement by God. So whether I forgive you or not has no meaning in the sense that forgiveness doesn't come from me. It comes from God. When the pastor announces the forgiveness of sins, he is not announcing his forgiveness. He is announcing God's forgiveness by the command and promise of God, by the way. But our forgiveness doesn't ever rest on our announcement. It's God's proclamation. Your sins are forgiven. This is a complete removal of guilt. So if Jesus has paid for all of the sin in the world, that means there's no debt left. No payment required. Nothing else to do. So often when we have a guilt trip, it's that we're still trying to figure out how to make an extra payment. The loan's canceled. The debt's paid. Complete removal of guilt. Forgiveness of sins is given to the repentant sinner who confesses his sins. David says that this person should have no deceit in his heart. It's not a liar, a hider, a faker. And of course, when somebody fakes God, do you think he's fooled for a second? So a person who pretends to be sorry and pretends to be penitent is not ever going to get past God's scrutiny. But God does see into the heart, and that always is part of our lesson on forgiveness. The forgiveness of sins produces joy in our forgiveness. So I told you earlier that your sins were forgiven. Did your heart explode with joy? You know, I knew I was going to say this sentence, and I don't know that my heart exploded with joy. It's very likely that we don't really understand the enormity of what God has done. The huge pile of sins that have actually been forgiven. I'm thinking that if we understood more about that, we would be a little bit more joyful when somebody says, your sins are forgiven. And the forgiveness of sins always inspires the desire to produce the fruit of repentance. To show in our lives our thank you to God for his grace and mercy. The forgiveness of sins. One of the main points of the first part of this psalm is King David is saying to us, don't be like me. And so his whole life is kind of like an audiovisual aid about how to not repent. King David was, uh, well, he should have been leading his army when he was busy being a peeping Tom on the roof of his house instead. He stole his neighbor's wife and covered up that sin with the blood of her husband. He had Uriah the Hittite, one of his famous generals and battle leaders. He had him killed by having the whole army, you know, they stick Uriah in the front lines, and then all of his friends and cohorts fall back, and he's left out there all by himself, and he's killed with the sword of the Amorites. God was not fooled by David's deception. But it's interesting to think about this, this image of the fact that King David tried to cover up his sins with the blood of Uriah. And then the noble king marries the wife of the grieving war widow, and oh, isn't he a wonderful guy? He's a master of deception. 
And when he does that, King David explains what his impenitence was like. One of the words for sin is the very strong Hebrew word for angelic. The bucking bronco, you try and put the bridle on that horse. You try to say, okay, calm down, boy, I'm going to put this saddle on you, and we're going to ride calmly around the corral. This isn't going to happen. In fact, the horse rears up, and it is not going to let you near him. To me, this was a really good picture for what rebellion is like. God says don't, and we rise up in rebellion against his words. We don't like them, and we're not going to do them. Aggressive and bold is this kind of impenitence. Oh, don't be like a horse or mule. Now, I know next to nothing about mules, but I have heard that when the mule doesn't want to do something or thinks it can't do something, it just sits down. So the, the bucking stallion is an act of aggressive rebellion. But sitting down and refusing to do anything is also rebellion. It's passive aggressive. And sometimes when God tells us to go and do, we just kind of sit down and we don't. We don't go and we don't do. Don't be like the horse or the mule that has no understanding. You see, God has a way of dealing with people like this. Uh, I suppose his message is really that resistance is feeble. But more important, resistance is deadly. David writes, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sacked as in the heat of summer. I wonder just how much of a connection there is between our physical discomforts, our lack of energy, our lack of will and desire, doesn't really just flow from the fact that we're not like we thought. We are harboring sins and carrying around guilt, unwilling and unable to confess our sins. And our strength is sapped as in the heat of summer. God also has another way of dealing with these impenitent sinners. And in the life of King David, it was a man named Nathan. Now I thought often about being in Nathan's sandals. This king, so he killed Goliath, right? Already a dangerous guy. And when sin was involved, he wasn't afraid to have Uriah the Hittite killed. And so now I'm going to go up to this king and I'm going to tell him that he's a sinner and that he's in big trouble with God. What's going to happen to me? I am very thankful that King David did not have me for a pastor, but had Nathan instead. Because the prophet Nathan comes to him and in a perfect way tells this little story about a man, a rich man, who had a neighbor who had nothing. Except a pet lamb. And the rich man is not about to take one single lamb from his herd when company arrives. No, he takes his neighbor's pet lamb instead. King David was furious as he ought to have been. And then Nathan said, You're the man. You're the one who used deceit and the blood of Uriah the Hittite to steal away from him his wife. And now all of Israel knows this because David wrote these psalms, it's, it's in their Bible. It's sung in hymns in their church. The whole world knows exactly what David did and the guilt that he tried to cover up with the blood of Uriah the Hittite is now out in front of us all. And so David writes, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. In this little verse, King David is helping us to think about the three different words for sin that you find very commonly in the Old Testament. The word sin is usually the word that means to miss the target. I think that's kind of a fun word for Christians because the truth is we're all here trying to worship, right? But sometimes we get distracted and it's kind of like the arrow that's heading straight to the bullseye that at the last minute spins out of control and might always stick in the dirt in front of the target. Not enough hope. I miss the target. Even when I'm trying really hard. The word transgression or trespass refers to somebody who's stepping across the line. And they know the line is there. This is open and active rebellion. Our problem in English is that when we hear the word trespass, this is a minor offense that most police officers, they don't arrest the kids stealing this from somebody. But when God says to do something or don't do something, and we rise up in rebellion or sit down in refusal, that is an active and aggressive kind of sin. The word that's translated iniquity and guilt means two things. It means guilt and it means debt. And it's up at either end of this sandwich because that's what you need to think about. That guilty feeling that we have is a reminder that you owe God. There's a payment that's being required. And I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my guilt. And almost in a perfect way, the blood of the Lamb that, ought, that makes our skins like, sins like scarlet be white as snow turns the picture around. And now suddenly there is an innocent one whose blood truly does cover up our sins. So when you think about that record book that God describes in Revelation where the lives of people are described in, the, in detail that only God would know. Somebody spilled blood on my page. And the sins that were recorded there can no longer be read. The Bible uses a number of pictures to help us think about what this forgiveness really is like. The first is the payment of debt. And because I have this house debt hanging over my head, I keep thinking about what it would mean if somebody would come to the door and hand deliver a document that says, U.S. Bank has reported now that your debt has been completely canceled. Somebody paid it for you. Oh, who did that? And my heart is exploding with joy and thankfulness. I may even offer to take him out for dinner. I might even be eternally grateful to them for what they have done. The debt is paid. Another picture that the Bible uses is the verdict of a judge. So the picture is really this. A person comes into court fully aware that they are guilty. And the enormity of the court and the weight of the evidence force this person to say, I'm guilty. And the judge says, this case has no standing in court. Your accuser, Satan, has been thrown out of court. We are not going to listen to a word he has to say. And by the way, your defense attorney has already paid your debt. He's died in your place. Not only are you not guilty, you are perfectly innocent. No charges are left on your record sheet. Not guilty. And the picture that Isaiah uses is the picture of, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. 
fortunately, I moved back to Minnesota where people actually know what snow is and what white as snow really looks like and how blinding it can be with this little ice on the trees and you, know, you can hardly look at it. The people who go up to Ant Ar the Arctic have to wear these special goggles when they go blind. White as snow. Not one spot, not one blemish, not one failing, not one speck of the light. Your sins are forgiven. And so the Bible uses these amazing pictures to help us think about what this great blessing and this great message of the church is really about. And it is a message, of course, for all people. The Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. Let's think about how this forgiveness plays out. So King David is busy covering up his sin. There's not a thing he's done in his life that would be like an invitation or that would be a good thing that God could say, oh, he's trying hard to be good. Nothing. And yet the prophet Nathan comes to David because God still loves David. God is initiating this call for repentance, and God is the one who has put away David's sin. This is what grace alone looks like in the life of King David. Nothing in my hand I bring. There's nothing I did. But God in his grace and mercy has put away my sin. There is then in the heart of a person this automatic response. This automatic response of joy. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. There is a joy that is in our heart. There is a message of joy that fills our that gladness, that, that, that shines on our faces. And there is this incredible blessing that God pours out on us. Blessed is the person whose transgression is forgiven, whose guilt is covered. The people of God have in their hands this treasure of the forgiveness of sins that pours out grace and every blessing into our lives. I am blessed because I have the forgiveness of sins. And that's a sentence that a person can say no matter what the other circumstances of their lives are. I am blessed because my transgression has been forgiven and my guilt has been covered. And that forgiveness, of course, produces the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Having been justified by faith, we have this peace of God. But I don't want you to miss what David has said. When he talks to you, the forgiven people of God, he says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. It's always kind of surprising to me that the epistles that Paul writes are very often addressed to the saints. So the saints in Corinth. And when you read the letter, you realize that the Corinthians are like anything but saints. So how in the world could the Bible call people like that saints righteous? This is because God's work has already been done, and St. Paul sees them for what God has made them to be. He sees you for what you have been made to be. Righteous. And every one of your lives now sanitized by God's grace and mercy really the life of Christ that you show on Judgment Day. That life the Bible calls upright. You're standing up straight and tall and walking in the right direction. You're not twisted. And so, what is the message of the forgiveness of sin? It is God has made you righteous and upright. This is the great treasure of the church, the forgiveness of sins. It is, opens the key to heaven. It is the key to heaven. 
And it is what the church must be preaching. The treasure that the church gets to share with the whole world. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Amen.